questions you would like to ask. Yes. Does this work? It's wonderful to see that despite the fact that the judiciary is totally infiltrated and the police as well, um, investigations still happen on the ground. And that is my question to you, is how do you explain that policemen are still doing their job despite um, the mafia having infiltrated the system? I would have thought, for example, that they would have created fake evidence that they would have added to the file or just run scam investigations to then just totally dismiss the case at an early stage, and yet we see that it's moving forward. So how do you explain that? It was an accident, actually. You know, the investigation was going nowhere, but people in the streets started to demand resignation of then police president Tibor Gaspar, and only when he resigned, the investigation accelerated and mostly because it was done by very young police investigator who came to the National Crime Agency of Slovakia like a week before. And because he didn't have other cases on his table, they put him on this case. And he started to investigate and he was investigating really according to the book. So it was impossible to attack his investigation. He put everything on a paper, every you know, step he needed to take that was not according to the book. He wanted in writing, and that was unheard of in Slovak police, and that's what has saved him, really. So, so yes, it was actually coincidence on many levels that they actually discovered not only those who pulled the trigger, but also those people who ordered the murder. Congratulations uh, for the movie, quite touching. Uh, but I see that a special role there was uh, of a whistleblower. Uh, and it seems that the information that it was released to you was crucial to, to kind of like uh, start the investigation. Uh, my question is also a little bit general. What journalism and what you could have done in the conditions if you are not going to have those uh, records coming from a whistleblower? It's probably the first one, first time anyone is talking about whistleblower. But okay, <laughs> let's stick to this concept. You know, it, it was not the beginning of the investigation. You know, right after the murder happened, OCCRP created this emergency team that was dropped to Slovakia to collect all the evidence that was there, that was possible. All CCTV footages, inter hours and hours of interviews, you know, following the crime scene, following the investigation, talking to the investigators. And it started to develop into, you know, our ambition was only to understand how the murder happened not, you know, to, to expose the whole corrupt system or the blueprint of corruption. But when we got the file, you know, it was there, so we did it. Um, yes. Somebody within the system? Uh, don't we, you, you call this a whistleblower? I can't really comment who gave us access to the file. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you may call that person a whistleblower, but usually, you know, I mean, a whistleblower is motivated by uh, sometimes other things that, than what this person was, you know, in for. It's. It's a, it's a bit tricky and we can't talk about it, you know, because it's, it's just, you know, I mean, we can't reveal the source, you know, in, a, in, in any case. Um, it's, it's, it's much more complex than just someone who was inside the system and wanted to do good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, eventually the story would have come out in, in pieces. I, I think what happened is it, it made 
it a lot easier. You know, we had, we had gotten independently um, all the video footage and we were starting to go through it ourselves. And so I think journalists would have worked on this. It, it, the, the whistle, the, the, the leak certainly helped move things a lot quicker uh, and, and made things happen a lot faster. But I think eventually, you know, we, we were not going to stop until we knew what, what had happened to Jan. So, you know. Um, and, and, and also, just to explain a bit better, maybe, um, sometimes what we do is we expose a criminal. Um, and it's not about this case in particular, it's, it's in general. We expose a criminal and years later, the same criminal that hated us before comes at us with information about other criminals. Now, how would you call that person? Would you call the person, a, you know, it's, it's a bit complex there. Hi. Um, my name is Siri Nelson and I'm the executive director of National Whistleblower Center. <laughs> And we do work with whistleblowers around the world. And um, I just want to comment on some of the misconceptions about whistleblowing that were communicated here. I understand wanting to protect your source. And part of the reason why I'm speaking now is also to reinforce that and say that a whistleblower doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who was part of the process or was in the government. It's just a person who had access to important information and independently came forward and provided that information to people who they believed would be able to do something about it. And then those people did something about it. So it doesn't have to be someone who was in the system or as long as they have information that's useful, that's really the most important component and that they came forward voluntarily. So it sounds like this person wasn't someone that you solicited or made an offer to. It sounds like they independently came forward whatever their reasoning might be. And um, I'm not gonna make any assumptions about that, but there's a lot of whistleblowers that have participated in crimes and still have been very useful and have had terrible motivations and have still been very useful. And in most of the important laws, that's not an important factor. But I wanna speak to a reaction that I had during the movie um, because there's a lot of times a tension between journalists and whistleblowers. And um, you know, as an advocate, it's important that I help whistleblowers understand their role and their rights. But this story really helped me understand how limited the scope of what the U.S. can do to impact whistleblower protections are and how important it is that um, people around the world are able to speak up and how creative journalists can be when they're trying to facilitate the um, good use of that information. So I just want to say thank you for your creativity and hopefully um, we can see a world where less of this type of issue is coming into play. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to say that you mentioned that it was just luck, but I think it's very important to note that you had a lot of work and the Slovak society had this resilience, which made still this area where all the things could have happened. So congrats on your work. I wanted to ask of like the role of Kochner and Böder and like how much, let's say, not for you, for journalists, but let's say for the general Slovak society, how well were they known and how much their connections to the high up politics was known, let's say, before this case, and how much has changed during these years of investigation. So maybe if you can talk about a bit this, thank you. We as a journalist were informing on corruption in Slovakia, within the police, within the political system, for ages, but we didn't have the proofs. And this was the first time we have hardcore evidence that would stand in trial that we could use. So, so this was new for us. You know, we were, we knew how it worked, but we were really not able to prove it. It was like, you know, someone told us that. Should we trust him? Not. Maybe. How should we verify? Impossible. And it was really the first time when we actually got to the messages on a cell phone of someone who really was part of the corruption system. And uh, people at the beginning were very receptive towards the information we provided as a journalist, but it faded out with the new government that just, you know, uh, the hope that was there, it somehow disappeared after three years because the new government did not really grab it 
or make use of it because they just were not ready to rule. I think that you mentioned that the polling recently showed the Smear uh, political party is now back in front and 40% they're expected to get in the next um, elections if things stay as they are, which is um, probably enough to become the ruling party again. So that's, that's a little bit depressing. Yes, it means we were fucked up. Congratulations on the documentary and all, all the work that it implies and I'm very impressed and um, it's uplifting in a very sad way. So I, I have like very uh, conflicted feelings about the whole, you know, the whole thing, what it, all that it took. I'm from Mexico, so we're used to journalists dying and nobody says anything. It's completely in, you know, in pure. my mother was a journalist too, so I feel it's so sad. You know, so many people were moved over there and in Mexico it happens and it's just, you know, in the news and that's it, nobody does anything. But my question actually is about, uh, it seems like a wonderful piece of like, almost a movie, like mystery movie or, or, or like, but everything seems like limited only to that country where they are in all these uh, emails and text and all of that. I'm sure there are connections with, uh, you know, other mafia in, in, in other countries and other governments and uh, because powerful people are connected. And I wonder if you are limited in your investigation and prosecution and, you know, only to your country or, or you know, because I'm sure there is like a, a mine of, of information that can connect with, with other criminals all over the world and especially that part of the world because, you know, they're, they're close, but... Anyway, okay, first of all, this is not my country. I'm living somewhere else and I was born somewhere else. So I was reporting on a country that's actually foreign country for me. And uh, it's blueprint, it's, it's a handbook of corruption. It's handbook of, of captured state. So you can't really see it as limited to one country because you have all the red flags, you have all the symptoms of corruption and captured state named there in the investigation, what means. Could you corrupt judge? Yes. Could you corrupt or blackmail prosecutor? Yes. Could you, you know, corrupt politician? Yes. You know, and, and those are the symptoms you can see in each of the countries that is kind of captured. And, and you know, when, when we started this project, the, the project, the story we were actually working with, with Jan, was about the Andragada Mafia and how they had substantial real estate holdings in Eastern Slovakia uh, uh, and how um, they were, you know, work, working, you know, basically, you know, on, on a regional crime network. And so that's really what started, it was a regional thing. But, you know, I mean, one, one thing about OCCRP, we've, we've always said, you know, when our reporter was arrested in Azerbaijan, uh, Hadija Ismailova, you know, we went after the government of Azerbaijan. We wrote more stories. And so, you know, to protect ourselves, we have to be aggressive at going after people who attack us. Um, and so when, when, when Jan was killed, you know, we immediately, you know, looked at the stories that he was working on and we were working on with him and said, we have to finish these and now we have to investigate his you know, is murder and understand what was happening. And, and through that method, you discourage people from attacking you in the future. So it was actually a strategy. But in Mexico, you know, every one of those murders is as rich and complex as this. And if you had a film crew for each of those murders, you could come up with an incredibly powerful film like this. And unfortunately, there's just not enough journalists um, doing this kind of work and there's not enough journalists following through and, and what I would always re highly recommend is you, we protect each other, the police do not protect us, nobody protects us but ourselves and our lawyer and, and, and we really have to go out and, and you know fight these fights ourselves as much as we can. You know Pavla was under police protection for a good part of the, this project. You know, um, we, we had, you know, grave concerns about, you know, these types of things. But unless you demonstrate that you can do the work yourself and that you can go after these people, you set yourself up for, again, future murders. What we want people to know is if you touch anybody at OCCRP, they're like a snake and they will come after you. And, and you know, that's part of our, 
our process of protecting ourselves. Yeah, and, and, and just something quick here. Um, the other thing that we understood from this investigation and other uh, investigations uh, into crime and corruption is that when you investigate isolated cases, um, you investigated some outcomes of the infrastructure that allows for this to happen. So in the, in the Slovakian case, we saw this infrastructure, judges, police, many others. Now this happens unfortunately in many countries. The same kind of corrupt systems take root and they grow and grow and grow over decades. And it's hard for investigative reporters, for civil society to understand the extent of corruption. But we're using this type of, um, of uh, you know, entry points into, into the corruption in, in a country to map the power, the crime in the country, to understand the infrastructure that allows for this because it's the only way to, to somehow stop the criminals from doing business as, as usual. Um, thank you for the film. Um, can you explain uh, the basis on which the Supreme Court overturned the not guilty verdict? Lack of evidence. Simply, okay, so it, it, I mean, the system is very Overturned different. that the, the first instance court did not consider all the evidence in the whole context. Mm -hmm. all right. you know, it's something that wouldn't happen in this country, but uh, it's a different system. But uh, I mean, if there was some fraud in the, in the process, yes, but otherwise, the appellate court wouldn't be overturning them. You know, the, 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 the main basis. break point yeah. was, were actually two, two, two break points. The first one was that the main witness that was actually, you know, accepting the guilt and saying, yes, I committed it, and it was on the order of mm -hmm. Zhuzhova and Kochner, mm -hmm. he was not found a trustworthy witness. Mm -hmm. And the second one was, you know, they were, even if they were using the encrypted Threema application, they used the code words. And the court said, maybe those are not code words, maybe they are really talking about itches and, and tooth and dentists and billboards and not the murders. But it turned out that, you know, the new trial is considering Andrushko, who, who is the key witness, is much more trustworthy because they merge the cases with a case of preparation of murder of three other prosecutors. And now it's a pattern. You know, you, you don't have one murder case. You have four more murder cases with the same symptoms. So it's much stronger. And also they had this kind of academic evaluation of the code words and you know, the guys from the university said, yes, they were actually not talking about the dentist and about the tooth that fall out. They were talking about something else. But there was no finding of corruption in the trial itself. No, no. actually it was not, it was much more alibism than corruption. So it was not very clear uh, in the movie how what was the connection of the of the former prime minister Fico with uh, with Marian uh, Kochner, uh, how he kind of like influenced or if if he also influenced the the, the prime minister because it's clear that he influenced the the prosecution and police and and so on, uh, and also uh, at the beginning there there was any other suspect for the murder of uh, John Kuchak or since the beginning it was quite clear that this was the only one so i will start from the second question first you know when we got access to the whole police file i discovered i was also the suspect there were about 10 leads uh there was kochner there was italian mafia there was me, there, were, there, there was one other Slovak journalist, and uh, so there were many more leads. And the first one was about, what was the first question? Sorry. Oh, yes. Um, Fico was not so stupid to communicate directly to Kochner, so it was through the middleman. Till today, you can't really prove any corruption of Fico because he's denying it all. And, you know, the prosecutors are politically affiliated, so they are not going against Fico 
or prime minister because they would lose the job. So it's slightly more complicated because he was really smart when you know getting all the bribes and also it was not him but his former wife who was setting offshore companies to get to, to manage the wealth and assets. But you know that's that's something we still need to develop and prove. But you know they were in touch but through the middleman, through the lawyer that was charged. He he has been indicted um uh as as a member of an organized crime group though. Fitzel. And he was cleared of the charges last week. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, and one last question. If not, then I appreciate you all coming. And thank you to the organizers.